I hope you've got your copy of God's Word. Look with me, if you would, there to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Let me go through a couple of things that are important this morning. Uh, number one, this is sanctity of human life. Uh, Sunday, we uh, need to keep all of that in our prayers and in our mind and um, pray for those that are faced uh, with uh, the world, luring them into a lie about how much better they will be uh, to um, have an abortion uh, and to pray for all of those who have undergone and struggle uh, with that decision that they've made. The other thing is this, uh, we've got a number of our folks that we really do need to pray for. Let me just give you these. Some of y'all will take these down. Uh, Miss Sherry Green, Mike and Sherry, dear sweet folks here in the church, keep her in your prayers. I'm almost certain she's going to have some surgery this week that was not expected. Uh, Mr. Dillard, talked to him yesterday, prayed with him yesterday. I told him, I said, I'm going to tell the church to keep you in prayer. And he was just so appreciative of the fact that you would pray for him. Uh, Hannah Blankenship, if you'll keep in prayer. Tim Adams is going to have to have surgery again sometime. He, he, this week, we think, we're not sure. Uh, Bart Clayton. Uh, Bart's going to have to have, I think, three bypasses. Uh, young guy. And uh, just keep Bart in your prayers. And Dick Quinn as well. So there's so many that we need to remember in prayer and to pray for. One other thing that I want to make mention to you is that after the service, I'll be out in the lobby. Uh, if you want to come talk to me, just come talk to me. But uh, I'm going to have some information on Egypt. I was reading this morning of a church that meets in a cave above the garbage dump in Cairo. And uh, we are helping to start a church plant in Cairo. Uh, we're going to be going in March. If you're interested in that, um, we'll sail down the Nile. I'm going to be filming a sermon to shoot back here, I hope, in front of the temple of um, Abu Simbel. Um, and I think I'm going to preach. What would you preach on if you had the opportunity to stand in front of the temple of Horus and preach? What would you preach on? I'm going to preach on idolatry. So I just kind of the backdrop, right? So there we go. Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, I want to give you kind of a quick introduction because this whole thing flows. This is one magnificent, colossal sentence. It would have been thrown out of English um, 101 because it is so long and um, it, it has so many clauses that are in it, uh, but it is wonderful praise. It, it's Paul who he, he barely introduces the letter and himself, uh, and then he just lapses into this incredible um, sentence of praise, and it has these three parts to it. You've got the part where he's praising God the Father for the plan of salvation in eternity past. We're going to come this morning now uh, where he praises Jesus Christ who brought about the redemption uh, and the salvation, which was God's plan from eternity past. And he's going to give us a view of the future. What does redemption mean for us uh, in the future? And then in verse 13 and 14, next week, Lord willing, we'll come back and we will look at uh, the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's covering the Trinity here, and he's looking at each part the Trinity plays in our salvation. Now, Paul is writing to a church that lives literally um, in, they are a speck in the sea of paganism. Uh, they live uh, feeling as if they are dwarfed in their culture because they follow Jesus Christ and the rest of the culture. The whole of the city lives in the shadow of uh, of uh, the temple of Diana, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I'll talk more about her as we go by. Uh, Diana was a rock that fell from the sky, but I'll just leave it at that, and I'll come back to talk to you uh, about who Diana, or Artemis, as she was called, uh, who she was, but they live in that cult. That's the center of the cult, and they literally, I think it must have been a piece of a meteor or something that fell um, if indeed it did fall and it was not just a story made up. But again, we'll come back to that. I keep going to it, don't I? Uh, we'll come back to that. 
uh, they lived under the darkness of the occult, literally of Satan worship, demon worship. And uh, these folks lived in this city where they were such a minority. And I have found that so many times when Christians live in a pressure cooker of culture where everything is against them, so often they will compromise the gospel in order just to feel like they fit into the culture somewhere. See also the church in 2023 in America. Well, I got that out my system. So we can come back now to uh, what we're doing here. Um, that's, that's the situation. That's who Paul is writing to. And Paul doesn't write them and just burst into this doxology of praise, uh, trying to get them hyped up, trying to get them pumped up. Come on, let's get you pumped up. That's not what Kirkwood does. That's not what I try to do. We're not here to try to get you pumped up. Let me, let me tell you, he does this because of what Christ means to him, what it means for him to be saved, and he knows that the best way to operate in the pressure cooker of culture is to worship God. You want to do something for your life personally? Then listen, the depression, uh, the discouragement of life, so many people walk into church and they walk out and they say, well, I got nothing out of that. They say, you haven't worshiped. You didn't really sing the songs. You didn't think about what was being said. You never bowed your head and spent time in prayer. You never took the word and actually held it, looked at it, read it, and then listened to uh, the pastors. He begins to just pull it apart and explain the word of God. Listen, if you do that, you can't help but go out of here more encouraged than when you came in. So that's what Paul is doing. He's trying to show these people, let me lead you into worship because worship is going to do more for you mentally, personally, emotionally, spiritually than anything else. Now, what he's doing here is this. He's going to show us that what God had planned in eternity past, Christ actually procured in time and space. Now, that... That's the thesis statement right there. Y'all all should be writing that down. What God planned and promised in eternity past, Jesus Christ actually procured. He did. He brought it about in time, in space, in a place called Calvary and the empty tomb. What he did was this. He brought into humanity the salvation that God has been planning since eternity past. And that's where Paul is when he comes in verse 7. So this all flows, that short introduction. I want to just move you into it because I'd love to take about an hour and a half and preach just through uh, verse 3 through verse 14, but I can't do that because y'all wouldn't stay. But um, I could do it, but y'all wouldn't do it. So let me pick it up in verse 7. And, and let me just begin to point out that you, I'm going to look at verse 7 and verse 8, and then I'm going to look at verse 9 through verse 12, because here he's going to say basically two things about this whole issue of salvation. Number one, Christ carried out the Father's plan in our redemption. This was God's plan all along. Before he created Adam, before he created Eve, before he created the earth, before he uh, put the sun in the sky and the moon in the night sky, all of this was God's design and desire. And so then he does create and he puts Adam and Eve in the garden. And in Genesis chapter 3, Adam sins. And when Adam rebels and sins, everything about humanity and everything about mankind and everything about creation just falls into disorder and disarray and confusion. So you have got everything that has just f broken apart completely from what God had just created, what he did. And not only was man sent spiraling down, but also all of creation was sent spiraling down. I read this week, it was fascinating. I came across an article this week in uh, a, a newspaper somewhere, it may have been um, the, the Daily Mail out of England, uh, where 
where the Hubble telescope has actually taken a picture or a n- numbers of pictures of two galaxies that are colliding together. And then the article went on to say that our galaxy is going to collide with Andromeda, which is the closest galaxy to us in about 4 billion years. So now listen, don't lose sleep over that, okay? So um, it, it's just kind of interesting. Every time you see, in fact, let me, do, let me do this. Let me take you back to Romans for a second. And let me just read something to you out of Romans, that the creation itself, this is in Romans chapter 8, uh, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. You see that? So when Adam sinned, he also bound to sin and corruption all of creation. It itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Every time you see a hurricane, every time you see reports of a tornado, every time you see... um, you know, a tsunami or an earthquake or something like that. It is all of creation groaning to be set free from this bondage to the God of this world whom the New Testament tells us is Satan. It waits. Isn't that amazing? It waits for salvation. All of creation, uh, the animal kingdom, Debbie's two dogs, Lord knows they need salvation. Um, everything, in, everything in the universe, it waits for this, including man. Man waits for this. He longs for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it, it begins to talk about the resurrection of Christ, but listen to what this says. For since by man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. As for in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Boy, that's a good word. Thankful for that right there because we are living under the bondage of Satan in the prison of uh, his, uh, his house and bound in chains of, of eternal darkness until we come to Jesus Christ. And so he comes to tell us this. In him, we have what? Now, he's going to give you four aspects of salvation, and the first is redemption. The first is redemption that he mentions right here. In him we have, look at this, redemption. And how do we have that redemption? It is through his blood. We have apolutro, apo from lutro, lutron, to release, uh, lutro, lutris, lutri, lutram, and lutredi, lut- Eddie, Lou, Usi. I had to get that out too because every time you see that was the word that we use to understand the paradigm. Um, to release from. Luo, I release. He released. He came and on the cross, what he did was he literally released us from the bondage we were in to Satan. He set us free. And he set us free from that debt by his blood, that, that by his blood, our debt has been paid in full, completely, and I'm released from it. Now, that's what happened. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. Mark tells us, Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to listen to this, and to give his life a ransom. There's the payment. Jesus himself became the payment for our ransom. We had been kidnapped. We really walked into it, into sin. We were held hostage by sin. Jesus came and on the cross, he paid the ransom and the ransom was his blood. Now that's why all of creation will rejoice. That's why all of what creation is waiting for. That's what mankind is waiting for. That's why when you come to Revelation chapter 5, and you get around the throne of Almighty God, you begin to see this taking place, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain, purchased for God with your blood, men 
from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Do you see this? All of creation, all of mankind, all of heaven, all of those wonderful, majestic, mysterious creatures in heaven are going to constantly sing praise to the lamb because he has died for us purchased us from hell and has brought us to the Father. Now, you're going to see that in the end in verse 12. <sighs> Y'all, please, please just calm down, okay? Um, that's a word. That's just the first thing that he says about redemption. It is always through the blood of Jesus Christ. But then comes the second thing. If you're looking in verse 7, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Now, this is interesting. I got to looking at this just a little bit ago. And uh, I got to looking at the word trespasses there, which is peripatoma. Uh, peripatoma. Peripateo means to walk around. Peripateo. This is what I'm doing. The prefix peri means around. Uh, uh, pateo is to walk. Comes out of padao, which is your foot. So you're, I'm walking around. Peripateo. But peri, peripatoma means a false step. See how it comes from that? A false step. A, a wrong step. In all of our lives, as we are walking through life, we have made some really bad steps. We have stepped in the wrong direction. We have walked down a wrong path. We have gone down the wrong road. And what he is saying here is this, is that he comes and he gives us forgiveness for every single step we've taken that was out of God's will. Now, he doesn't just come and deliver us. He comes and he forgives us. He doesn't just get us out, buy us out of bondage, and then just say, hey, don't ever make a mistake again. He and then he goes his way. He comes and he brings forgiveness for the very thing that put us in bondage. Now, what that means is this, is that he forgives my sins and that takes away the guilt of my former sins because we struggle and we deal with all of this guilt for things that we've done. Um, I enjoy World War II history and um, I was reading an article on Albert Speer. Albert Speer in 1933 was a young architect who, went, who was in Berlin and went to a rally where Adolf Hitler was speaking, and at that rally, he absolutely... Now, listen, this is a German. They're smart people to begin with. Uh, number two, a, an architect, um, a, a profession, and uh, which takes a lot of mathematics, smart guy, um, well-educated, and he falls head over heels infatuated with Adolf Hitler. It's not just dumb country people that are suckered into stuff. It's people with PhDs a lot of time. Amen. He goes and he, he listens to him, and of course, Hitler brings him into his inner circle, and he wants him to design because Hitler was this frustrated architect himself. Uh, he wanted him to design a whole new city for Berlin. He wanted all of these things built, all of this stuff built all across Germany. And Speer begins to design these things. But as the war uh, breaks out and gets uh, very difficult, he takes Speer and he moves him into being the Reich's Minister of Armament and Munitions. And so he is over all of the munitions, all of this kind of stuff. Well, when the war is over... There are 24 Nazi leaders that are captured and are brought to trial in Nuremberg. And there in Nuremberg, uh, they put all 24 on trial, and there's only one man out of all 24 that admits to a degree that he was wrong and apologizes. And it was Speer. 
They put him for 20 years in Spandau. 20 years he spends in Spandau, and he comes out, and he begins to take interviews, and he does an interview with Good Morning America. And in that interview, the interviewer, and I can't remember who it was, uh, the interviewer made the statement to him uh, about his statement about forgiveness. He says, you feel like people who have, have done these things uh, should never be forgiven or can never be forgiven. And they said, do you still feel this way? Now listen to what Spear said. I served a sentence of 20 years and I could say I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment, but I can't get rid of it. You ever felt that way? Guilt? I can't get rid of it. I've done my time, spent the time in prison, paid my penalty. He was writing a new book and listen to what he says. The, this new book is part of my atoning of clearing my conscience. Now, writing a book will not clear you of anything. So Chuck Colson is watching this. Colson writes about it in his book, Who Speaks for God? And he uh, talks about the interviewer who went on and asked Spear and said, you really don't think you'll be able to clear your conscience totally, do you? And Spear shook his head and said, I don't think it will be possible. Now listen to what Colson said. For 35 years, Spear had accepted complete responsibility for his crime. His writings were filled with contrition and warnings to others to avoid moral sin. He desperately sought expiation all to no avail. I wanted to write Spear to tell him about Jesus and his death on the cross and God's forgiveness, but there wasn't time. The ABC interview was his last public statement, and he died of a stroke right after that. Let me tell you something. Forgiveness is found only in Jesus Christ. Never in the things that we can do. You can never do enough to silence your conscience. Well, let me give you the third thing. The third thing is this, grace. Look at what he says right here, verse 7, in him we have redemption. That's the first thing, through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, number two. Number three, according to the riches of his grace. Now, how does God give us all of this redemption? How does he give us all of this forgiveness? Out of the riches of his grace. It's out of the riches of his grace. This, the, the word there is well, let me just read on. Uh, the word there is this, according to the riches of his grace. Then verse 8, let me hold on verse 8. Let me just give you this at verse 7. According to, kata is the word in the Greek. Uh, it's just a little particle that is there, and it means according to uh, plutase. The plutase means an abundance of wealth. Great wealth, much wealth is what he's saying. He gave according to his riches. That is different. Now listen, li different to, now listen to me carefully. That is different than God giving to us according to his riches. He gives us, uh, 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 out of his riches, he gives us according to his riches, not out of his riches. There's a difference in the two. You say, well, I, what, what, explain that to you. He gives to us according to his riches, not out of his riches. I can give you something out of my riches, but it won't be a whole lot. This is a famous picture of John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in the world. Do you know that Rockefeller and Chase and a couple of other guys, there, he looks a lot like me. No, there he is right there. There he is, John D. Rockefeller in, in the middle of the Depression, this is, a, the most, this is probably the most famous picture of Rockefeller. He's given this little boy right here a dime. Richest man in the world. He and Chase and one or two other guys during the Depression got the United States through it. The United States government went to this guy and said, can we borrow some money from you? This guy right here, Rockefeller, and Chase and one or two others. And here he is, he's giving this boy. Now you just think, well, gosh, they, they were there and took that picture. No, he took photographers with him and he did this all over the place. 
so that everywhere he was, every time he came across a child, he'd give a child a dime. Now, Rockefeller could have given him $10,000 in 1930. He could have given him $10,000. He could have given him a brownstone in New York up on 66 or 67th or 68th or 70th Street. In New York. He could have given him a Duesenberg to drive. He could have given him maids and butlers and all of that according to his wealth. But he gave to him out of his wealth, not according to his wealth. Do you see that? I'm just going to stop and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to start going through names here. Now, do you understand that? Do you understand? Do you get this? God doesn't give to us out of. He gives according to. And look at the difference that that makes. Look at what he says now down here in this next verse, verse 8, he lavished. That means to splash out. You, you've got something that is so full that if you put another drop, it just splashes out. It just runs over. He just lavishes his grace on you. When you realize that, when it finally connects in your head and in your soul and in your heart, how much grace it took to save your old dark soul, you shout. He lavished it on you. He gave you way more than was necessary. And look at what this does. Now, this is the fascinating thing to me. Look at what this does. He says, he lavished it on us in all wisdom and insight. That's a concept there on wisdom and insight. That's discernment. That's the fourth thing that he gives to us. He so lavished it on us that it brings to us godly wisdom. I just wrote a book on that. By the way, it'll be here, I think, this week. Uh, it's sold out. I didn't know. They, ain't, they don't, hadn't told me anything. But I saw it on Amazon where it, did, where it sold out. Anyway, here is, here is what he's saying. He so lavished it on us that it just brings to us this godly wisdom and this phronase, frontal wisdom. Phronase, it's your brain. It's the ability, wisdom is the ability to take knowledge and to operate that knowledge uh, in such a way that it brings good for you and glory to God. Insight is understanding. Understanding, according to Ronica and Rogers, is this. It means literally that I am able to discern modes of action. And you say, well, I, I'm not sure I'm following you. Which action should I take in this situation? I can do this, and it's going to have this kind of result, and it's going to have, and this is what that's going to look like. Or I can do this. Now, let me, let me just give you an example of it. You, you go to a doctor this week, and you've got to have a little surgery. And uh, uh, you, you say, now, doctor, you, you can do this. You can cut that out. Yes. Can you sew me back up? You better hope and pray he can do more and sew you back up. Because I can sew you back up. You just don't want to look like Frankenstein when you come out of it. You see, it, it would be pretty. So you get a doctor and a doctor comes, a surgeon comes, and he's going to know what type of suture you're going to need. Whether you're going to need an absorbable suture or an unabsorbable, non-absorbable suture. He's going to come and he's going to know what kind of material is that suture going to need to be made out of monofilament, just one thread or a braided thread of that, that's braided together. And then listen, you, you got to know, he's got to know not just about the suture. He's got to know what kind of stitch you're going to need. He's going to need to know, is it continuous or is it uh, an interrupted stitch or a deep stitch or a buried stitch or a purse string stitch or a subcontaneous stitch? I want my doctor to know that stuff. That's why I want him to be about 70 years of age. I want him to be well experienced in all of this. Listen. This whole idea of understanding is that God gives you the ability beyond education with his wisdom and his insight to make the right choices that have the best outcomes. 
Now, I just gave you a whole bunch of stuff about stitches. I don't know. I wrote that stuff down. But I'm going to tell you what I do know. I had a grandmom and a granddaddy that had no education. They could read. They were not illiterate. They could read. They could write. Um, as Jethro said, they could do their ciphers. Um, they, they could add. They could multiply. They could divide. They could subtract. But they had no education. But they lived a life of integrity, honesty, and they were noble in their living because they had something that this generation has thrown away. It's called the book. My dad didn't have but an eighth grade education. My mama didn't have but an 11th grade education. And yet my dad started a business. He had no idea how to do a filing system. I don't know how my dad did what he did because he had no, because all you had to do is go and look in his office and you could tell this man has no concept of what it means to file something. <laughs> and yet my dad was fairly successful. And the reason my dad was successful was because he had put his trust not in his education, but this was his textbook. I don't think there was much of a day in my life growing up that I did not see my dad with his Bible in his hand and at times, many times, seeing my dad on his knees in prayer. Alan Bloom said the same thing. Do you all remember who Alan Bloom was? He wrote the book in 1987 called The Closing of the American Mind. Alan Bloom was a Jew and he finished the University of Chicago with a bachelor's at 18 years of age and then went on and worked for a Ph.D. He taught in Paris. He taught at the University of Chicago. He taught in New York City. He taught multiple places, and he wrote this book, The Closing of the American Mind, and in that book, he was looking at the failure of higher education. He's almost an Old Testament prophet. Listen to what he said. I do not believe. Now, this is a, a Jewish man, Ph.D., University of Chicago, which is not the bastion of conservatism, I can tell you. I do not believe that my generation, my cousins, who have been educated in the American way, all of whom are M.D.s or Ph.D.s, have any comparable learning with what our grandparents had. When they talk about heaven and earth, the, the relations between men and women, parents and children, the human condition, I hear nothing but cliches, superficialities, and the material of satire, cynicism, in other words. I am not saying anything so trite as that life is fuller when people have myths to live by. I mean, rather, that a life based on the book is closer to the truth that it provides than the material for deeper research in and access to the real nature of things. Amen. Now that just blows my mind. Though my parents had very little in the way of education, they knew how to relate to people. They knew how to carry on a conversation. They knew how to talk. They knew ethics. They knew morals. They knew what financial responsibility was. And above most everything else, they understood the principle of self-discipline. Many times as a young teen, I would ask my dad, why couldn't we join the country club? And my daddy said, I don't drink. And I said, well, what's that got to do with it? He said, because that's all they do. And he said, if I did drink, I wouldn't be drinking with them. <laughs> and so I would continue to pick at him about things. And I would say, but daddy, we have the money. He said, son, just because you have the money doesn't mean you need it. Wow. That's a word for this generation. You don't have to have it just because everybody else does. That's wisdom. That's insight. 
That's what you get when you come to Jesus. Well, what are we doing? See, y'all get me off on stuff. I had no intention to go. Let me give you the last thing. I'm four seconds over, so let me give you this very quickly. The last thing, the second thing is this, out of this passage here, beginning in verse 9, is that God reveals the future of the redeemed. Now, I'm redeemed. My sins are forgiven. I've experienced all of this according to the riches of his grace. He's lavished it on me. He's given me wisdom and insight. Now, what is all this going to do? Watch this. Let me do this quickly with you right now. One is there is going to be a gathering under. He's going to turn and he's going to look toward the future and what's going to happen to the redeemed. He made known to us the mystery of his will. I've always wanted to know the mystery of God's will. We walk around talking about, oh, it's such a mystery. I wish I could know. Well, listen to this. He made known to us the mystery of his will, that is salvation, redemption, forgiveness of our sins, according to his kind intention, which he, God the Father, purposed in him, God the Son, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. By the way, in Christ is used nine times here. He comes and he says, the summing up of all things. This is a gathering under. And you say, well, what does this mean? It means this. What Paul has just said there is this, is that because of what Christ has done in our redemption, God the Father is bringing together everything in the universe, everything in the universe, everything on the earth and everything in humankind All of it is coming. He's gathering it, and he's putting it under the feet of Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's a great thought, but what does that mean to me? It means to me this. I don't sit around and lie awake at night and worry about what Russia and Ukraine are doing or what China's doing across the Straits of Taiwan or what is happening in the Red Sea between the United States and Great Britain and Japan and Denmark and all these others and these in these hootie rebels. I don't lie awake and worry. You know why? Because I know that the world and all of history is headed to the feet of Almighty God who is going to place it under the feet of Jesus Christ. There's going to be a gathering up. Now, you want to know what's going to happen in the future? It's all going to be placed under the feet of Jesus. The second thing is this, go back, just look at what he says, pick it up in verse 11. There is going to be this working out, uh, this, uh, this whole thing of working all of this out. Also, we have obtained an inheritance. I'd love to talk about that. We've got this inheritance that uh, is going to be ours. Having been predestined according to his purpose, I've come to Jesus Christ. We looked at predestination last week. And as I come to Jesus Christ, he has predestined me to become conformed to the image of his son. I'm to become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what I've been predestined to do. That's according to his purpose, who works all things. You see this? It's a working out. He works all things after the counsel of his will. And you say, well, now what does that mean? It means this, God's going to work everything in your life out. That's what he says in Romans chapter 8. He causes all things to work together. Sunergo, with work to work together with. He causes all things to work together so that everything comes out the way he's purposed in your life. You say, well, I just don't understand some of this. I don't understand why I have this struggle. How is that the working out of God? I don't understand why I have this problem, why I've got this health issue, why this, why that, why the other. Listen, let me tell you, God is working all things together Because he's going to work things out in your life that you think cannot be resolved. Now, let me give you the last thing. And the last thing is is this. It is a shining up. It is a gathering under, a working out, and a shining up. Look at verse 12. To the end. What's going to be the end of all this? That we who were the first to hope in Christ... Those of us that have put our faith and our trust and our belief in Jesus Christ would be to the praise 
of God's glory. Now, this is the best thing of all right here. We not only get an inheritance, but you are an inheritance. And you say, well, I don't understand that. One day, when we're called up to be with our Lord, he is going to walk you in and he's going to stand you before the Father and he's going to say to the Father, here's part of your inheritance. You, you are going to be in it. You say, I just, that's just too much for me to take in that I am going to be the inheritance that Christ gives to the Father. You know, we... I grew up Baptist. I was in a Baptist church nine months before I was born. <laughs> and unlike my wife, who was an associate Reformed Presbyterian, we had to go to church on Sunday night. And she got to sit home and watch Rudolph <laughs> and Frosty and the Wizard of Oz. I was in my 30s. I've been in therapy since because I didn't get to see <laughs> Wizard of Oz. When they went to the Emerald City, it is amazing what they did with them as they got to the Emerald City. They go in, look, wash and brush up, company. They're stuffing the old scarecrow. Remember how the witch monkeys had torn him all apart? And it was just the head lying there. Just, and there's the tin man who's cried and he rusted himself out and then you get down here to Dorothy, and I don't know what all they do with Dorothy. They're going to put perfume on her, and there's that little demonic dog like Debbie's. And, <laughs> and then, then you get, look, here, here he is, the guy that runs off, chicken, scared, all the time. They're trimming and curling, and they got hot irons, and they're giving him, you know, manicures and pedicures and all of that. And there they go, and they're going to go off to see the wizard. What I wanted you to see in all of that is this, is there they go. They're all done up. Jesus is going to do that to you. Amen. He's not going to stuff you with hay, but he's going to stuff you with his righteousness. Amen. He's not going to put oil and get a buffer on you, but he is going to wash you in the blood. And uh, he's not just going to put curls in your hair. He's going to put hope in your heart. Amen. And one day he's going to take you and all those tears you've cried, and all that grieving, and all that worry, and all of the things that have hurt, and all of the pain, and all of the questions, and all of the anxiety, every bit of that, God is just polishing up those things that are facets in the jewel that is you. So that when he stands you before the Father one day, you will reflect the glory. Your tears, your hurt, your pain, your loss will all reflect like the facets of a diamond, the glory of God. That is your future in Jesus Christ. Let's stand.